Hi guys, good morning. I'm very excited. Um, good morning, Danny, first of all. Good morning, Oren. I'm very excited today. We are going up to Temple Mount. Although I have like almost 100 videos, I haven't done a single video about Temple Mount. And today I'm here with Danny the Digger, a friend and a colleague. Um, we are both tour guides, but he is an archaeologist as well. So it's a huge bonus here. Before we go up to the Temple Mount, what can we see here? This is pretty exciting that just before you go up to the Temple Mount, at the entry, you can see on your left the Prain Plaza, the very holy part of the Western Retaining Wall where Jews for centuries gather and pray. And their prayers are mostly expressions of longings to the lost temple. The first temple built by Solomon, the second one, all, both of them stood on the Temple Mount where we're going into now. And yet, once destroyed by the Romans, it has not been rebuilt to our times. Okay. And one reason it has not been rebuilt is because now it has a completely different identity, a Muslim identity. So we are now entering the Temple Mount. What a place. Maybe the most sacred and most controversial mountain in the world. Right in front of us is the El Aqsa Max. The Al Aqsa word stands for the Hebrew word Hakitzon, the far most. My Muslim claim this is the very place from where Muhammad flew on his winged horse from Mecca and ascended up to the heavens, negotiated with God on how many prayers should a good Muslim pray each day. God, must, God wanted 50, he took him down to five. And he came back with the rules of daily prayers of Islam. Now, here's the thing. The Quran doesn't say exactly where it happened. It doesn't give us GPS coordinates. It says Al-Aqsa Mosque or Masjid Al-Aqsa, yes? The far most. If you're in Mecca or Medina, the far most could be anywhere. It doesn't say Jerusalem in it. In fact, it never mentions Jerusalem anywhere in the Quran. It is Muslim tradition like many other traditions, not only over here, but over all of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a fantastic mix of facts, history, archaeology, and faiths, and beliefs, and tradition. Once Jerusalem was in the hands of the Muslims, they gradually started attributing this very site, this Temple Mount, which was in ruins at the time, is the place of this event. And the Dome of the, Mar of the Rock today, with everything else today by Muslim belief, is all related to that holy night journey to get the prayers of Islam. I actually want to start over here, okay. where one can see remains of previous period. So Oren, as you enter the Temple Mount, the first thing that you see here on your right is the Al-Aqsa Islamic Museum. And I've been there in the past, today it's also, uh, the entry is restricted, but if you do go in, you see only Muslim artifacts reflecting only the Muslim history of this Temple Mount. However, here in the courtyard, there are many, many architectural elements that are from a period when the mountain was not in their hands. And if, you, if you've been, if you've visited the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, you might say, hmm, I know this from somewhere. Exactly. And this is indeed a reflection of the Byzantine and mostly the Crusaders period when Christians ruled Jerusalem and also ruled the Temple Mount. And there's even places where if you look closely, Oren, you can find crosses in the capitals. Follow me. Okay, these are uh, typical uh, Corinthian capitals, which originally come from the Greek world but they were used also in Roman times and also later in Byzantine and even Crusader times. And here, this Crusader area capital actually had a cross chiseled on it. The Muslims chipped off the upper part so it doesn't make it too obviously a, a Christian symbol, but they left it. And it's not the only place where you can see remnants of Christian symbols or Crusader symbols of royalty, the fleur de lis. Okay, that specific shape of a flower, which is used to this day in France as a national symbol, is also found here in some of the decorations of the capitals. 
and you also have elbow capitals. Elbow capitals are so typical uh, to the time of the Crusaders. Here's a fleur de lis. Here's one image of it. And there are other places where you can see it more clearly. So first of all, we can all agree now that Christians once held this mountain. Now, during the Byzantine period, there's a big question whether they had here anything. The historical sources tell us that they deliberately left it in ruins to show how Christianity prevailed over Judaism. To show the Jewish temple in ruins was showing the triumph of Christianity and its validity as replacing animal sacrificing, replacing the old style of Judaism, replacing the Old Testament with a New Testament. However, modern research is now suggesting that maybe there were at least some Christian chapels here in the Byzantine period. In the time of the Crusaders, everyone agrees there was a big Christian presence here. First of all, when the Crusaders conquered the Temple Mount, they butchered all the Muslims. So they didn't have any Muslim to ask him, what does this symbolize for Islam? And you know what they identified it as? Who won't believe it? As the Jewish temple, as the temple that Jesus visited. So they labeled it Templum Domini. They put a big golden cross over it and they made a special order to protect it instead of knocking it down. That order was called the Templars, okay? And their headquarters was actually in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which they labeled as Templum Solomoni. And the big hallways that are also beneath us were labeled as Solomon Stables. And Oren, I know it's hard to believe it today, but during the 12th century, this was a big headquarters of a Christian military order. These architectural elements are an echo of that period, and also in the front of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, you can track it. All of the capitals that we see here were found here. They were found scattered in the area. I, I can't say today when they were brought here and placed here, but they are all coming from the Temple Mount and its surroundings. That is true. And there's a beautiful garden of architectural elements laid on the sides here, waiting maybe for one day to be analyzed and placed in a, in a better position with explanation. It's like a junkyard of architectural elements from so many different periods. If we walk over here, you can see some spectacular, big size uh, Corinthian capitals like elements. In any other country, all of this would be in a museum. In a museum, and, behind and glass. And, and here it is like a junkyard. The main place for congregating for Muslims is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is actually the biggest mosque in the Holy Land. And it is also a magnificent piece of architecture. But if you look at the details, you can see some remnants of the time that it had a completely different identity or The grandest shrine at the very center of the Temple Mount is called the Dome of the Rock. Kipata Sela Kubbat El Sahra. It is a magnificent giant structure, one of the oldest, no, actually the very oldest Muslim shrine in Muslim history. Just look at this in this morning hour. Underneath it, it's all supporting a big natural piece of rock, heavily scarred from people taking scraps of it in the past as souvenirs. But in one of its corners, there's an indentation. That indentation is said to be by Muslim belief, the very footprint of Muhammad when he ascended up to the heavens to get the prayers of Islam. It is a place of pilgrimage, a place of gathering. It's not a mosque. Until the 19th century, there were some scholars at least that were allowed to go up to the Temple Mount, but then the Muslims became more and more stingy about non-Muslim visits. Uh, the result is that only in the 19th century we have some archaeological data from surveys, not even digs. And then in 1948, in the big war, the Jordanians got a hold of the Temple Mount and became the custodians of this place. And since the Hashemite royal family relates to Muhammad, the, the Muslim world and the local Muslim people here relatively accepted it. But in the Six-Day War, 1967, Israel gets a hold of it. Israel, the Jewish state. Now, for the Jews, this is a return 
to our ancestral land and this is a return to our sacred place. From this a Muslim, is the holiest place. of course, and the only place. There is no other holy place for Jews. For the Muslims, this was a terrible insult. The third holiest place in Islam since 67 is under Jewish hands. And to add an insult to this, a few years ago, after many years that the rabbis banned Jews from going up here, some rabbis said, actually you can ascend up to the Temple Mount. You cannot go up to the central part, but you can walk around the perimeter. And the Muslims got very intimidated by this new attitude. And what you are watching right now is a live demonstration of the tension during the visit of religious Jews. They are escorted by police. What's amazing is that you're seeing those Jews, religious Jews, going up, walking on the perimeter, barefoot because of realizing the sanctity of the place. But Oren, they cannot pray. If they start praying, the policemen of the Jewish state of Israel will throw them out. This is the status quo here, whoever you like it or not. And what one gentleman at least is doing right now, walking backwards and reading texts from the phone, he's actually praying. But he's not doing it from a prayer book and he's not bowing to make it too obvious. Okay, but here behind us is the representative of the WAP also following their steps. And to make sure they are not praying. Pr praying loudly or too obviously. And if it gets too loud, then it gets messy here. Okay, this place is very, very sensitive. And uh, we witnessed when we were preparing our gear, a tour group, just a proper tour group. They look like Christians, yet one of them had a Bible with him. And guess what? The policeman wouldn't allow him to go up with a Bible. You cannot enter the Temple Mount dressed immodestly, meaning even shorts are forbidden. You cannot uh, carry the Bible. You cannot carry as a tour guide any gear that shows the Temple Mount in other periods. It's all forbidden. This place is very, very volatile and operates on a very, very tense daily basis. Hello. סתם מצלמים. אתם מצלמים כאילו את הליווי? את הר הבית, כרגע מתארים את היהודים עולים למעלה. אם זה מפריע אז נפסיק. So the policeman asked us what we were doing, which makes sense as we have been following this group and filming them for a couple of minutes now. Okay, or right, now we are in front of this grand mosque, the biggest mosque in the Holy Land, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Its name is uh, expressing the Muslim belief that uh, this is the place from where Muhammad ascended to heaven to get the prayers of Islam. However, I must say that in the past, they also identified this holy area with Solomon's temple. Okay, 9th century Muslim sources label this place as Bayt al-Maqdas, the place of the, of the temple, of the Jewish temple. And until the 1960s, the Waqf would distribute here pamphlets which explain the mountain which included the sentence saying that the identity of this place with Solomon's temple is beyond dispute. Beyond dispute. Today, however, the Muslim agenda completely denies the Jewish past of this mountain for obvious political reasons. The question is, can archaeology detect traces of that Jewish temple? And any other periods that uh, other religions mastered this mountain? And the answer is, Yes, big time. First of all, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The front of it does not look like a typical mosque. It has elements from the time of the Crusaders. It has those elbow capitals. It has those small columns. And most amazing, Oren, captured the pigeon over the niche on the left, and there's one also on the right. These decorative elements appear in churches. And this is a, a little testimony, possible testimony, that once upon a time when the Crusaders ruled the Temple Mount, their headquarters was right here, as the historical sources tell us, the Templars. And maybe, maybe they had images of Jesus and Mary right there. Another fascinating fact is that this stairway, now leading to an underground mosque, this, this big mosque on the surface is not enough, what the Crusaders once labeled as Solomon's stables, the big underground halls spread all over the corner of the Temple Mount, now leads to another grand underground mosque, but it's the same line, path, 
that leads to the southern wall where you had the double gate and the triple gate. And Maybe we will see it later from the other side. Yes, that can be another video showing the, the evidence, the ample of evidence from the time of the Jewish temple when Jesus probably went there and people bathed before going up to the Temple Mount. This stairway today leading to a mosque was once the exit out of the Temple Mount during the time of the Jewish temple. What a beautiful sunny day, yeah. Lorraine, eh? End of November, we are with t-shirts. Yes, global warming is real. <laughs> It should be raining by now, or at least <laughs> chilly. <laughs> yeah. In two days, I think it should start raining. It is going to change soon, but it's way too warm for November. Yes, even in the Holy Land. Oren, this is such a, another beautiful angle of the Dome of the Rock and the arches uh, and the path leading to it. But I want our attention now on this little piece of bedrock. Bedrock is very important on the Temple Mount because if it's here today, unlike structures, it was here also millions of years ago. Meaning the Temple Mount may have been in the past higher, but never lower. And indeed, scholars believe that this little part of bedrock is actually part of a very wide stairway, like the stairway that exists that has been found at the Southern Wall Archaeological Park meaning when you ascended up to the Temple Mount, you entered from a certain underground path, you could walk on the courtyard, the outer perimeter, which was apparently of a lower level, and then from here, you would ascend to the central upper higher raised platform in front of the Jewish Temple. Today, you also have wide stairway, which in my opinion is reflecting the stairway that existed here in the past. And we actually have archaeology attesting to how Josephus describes the inner, upper, higher raised platform. He said that it had a fence made out of many, many inscriptions warning visitors in different languages that up to this point, everyone's welcome. Beyond the certain frame, that, that fence, only Jews who have been purified are allowed to go in. And if you do not follow, you will face the penalty of Thanatos. Thanatos means death. And we actually found two, not one, but two copies of that warning in Greek. One is in Turkey, one is here at the Israel Museum where the word Thanatos in the last sentence, in the last line is very, very clear. Josephus was correct. Josephus is a very accurate source when it comes to uh, showing images of buildings of cities and here we have a little hint to his accuracy also when he describes the Jewish temple. Oh, this is amazing. I, I never saw it. You saw it? I saw it. <laughs> yes, I you never I, realized. I must say, I also did not regard it till I actually read archaeological reports. And Shimon Gibson is, is a distinguished archaeologist who was the first, to my knowledge, to uh, publish the opinion that this is all part of the Crepidomia part of the outer stairway that led to the upper central raised platform. And all you need to imagine is this big white edifice that once stood here. And of course, the smoke from the endless flow of animal sacrifice, especially in the high uh, holidays of the Jews. And evidence of this was also found in the form of many, many animal bones when we conducted some salvage excavations in the Kidron Valley. It's the industrial waste of all of this animal sacrifice. We found big time the testimony of this as well. Okay, Oren, we are now walking along the eastern side of the Temple Mount. I can actually see some more religious Jews walking there. Uh, as we spoke before, walking only on the perimeter, barefoot, and looking towards the Dome of the Rock, but reflecting on the time that it had the Jewish Temple there. But the reason I wanted us to walk also here is because of this enigmatic gate complex at the eastern uh, wall of the Temple Mount, which by Jewish tradition is called the Golden Gate or the Gate of Mercy. And it is said to be the gate through which the Messiah will one day come at the end of times, bringing a heavenly Jerusalem and so on. Okay, the Jews say it will be the first arrival of the Messiah. The Christians believe it will be his return. But both agree 
it will be through this gate. Now, there is a slight technical problem about all of these apocalyptic visions, and that is that the gate is locked. The gate, oh, actually right now it's open on the inner side, but on the other side there's a big wall being there for centuries, blocking any entry into the Temple Mount. It was probably done in the time of the Muslims anticipating the Crusaders or by the Crusaders anticipating the return of the Muslims, one of the two. For many, many years it was a storage area, but look at this. It is now a mosque. Another element in the Temple Mount that has been Muslimized into a mosque, and I see some women reading, not the Talmud, the Quran, <laughs> uh, and which is interesting by itself. My question as an archaeologist is from which period is it? And it's a big archaeological riddle. It's definitely not from the time of the Second Temple. In the 19th century, they actually did find the evidence of the Eastern gate that we know was here buried beneath it. Nowadays it's not available, there's a Muslim cemetery on the outside. But if you look at the elements today, it is very, very puzzling because you cannot say with certainty whether it's Muslim or Byzantine Christian. And I like the proposal that this was built by the last significant uh, Byzantine Emperor Heraclius. In 614 this city was attacked and plundered by a uh, Persian invasion. They massacred the Christian population here. But a few years later, Heraclius, the emperor, managed to get an army and fight the Persians back. And most significant, he managed to obtain a piece of wood that was very, very important for the Christians and was taken by the Persians from Jerusalem. What the Christians believe is a eclipse, a piece of the true cross. And Heraclius managed to get it back, and when he brought it back, we are told that he brought it in a big ceremony. Maybe, maybe he made this gate to mark his ceremonial remarkable entry, returning the piece of the true cross back to Jerusalem. And maybe the only significant architectural element we can see today from that Byzantine period, the period in which we believe, most scholars believe, the Temple Mount was left in ruins to show the destruction not just of the temple but of, Jeru of the Jews for not accepting the faith in Jesus. And here you have something that is Byzantine Christian relating to a very significant event that happened just a decade before the final conquest of Jerusalem by Islam in 638 and then gradually Muslimizing the whole Temple Mount which is the current state of affairs to this day. So what you see here more than anything else, in my opinion, is how one holy place for one religion will be contested by another. And it didn't start with the Jews, with all respect. We, the Bible is the oldest historical record for the sanctification of this mountain by Jews. But in my humble opinion, already in Canaanite times, Canaanites worship a specific God here, a God called Shalem. We know of the existence of this God from, from uh, the Ugaritic uh, library and he was the son of El, the chief god. And maybe the name Jerusalem means Ir Shalem, the city of Shalem. And I'll tell you more than this, Oren. I think when David took over Jerusalem, he didn't completely ban the worship of Shalem for the worship of the God of Israel. Because how does he name two of his sons? One he calls Av Shalom, and the other who succeeded him, Shlomo. Both kind of relate to the name Shalem. And as for Shlomo, the Bible admits, yes, he built the temple, but he was worshiping other gods at the same time. There was maybe a period of overlapping religions, Canaanite and gradually the Israelite. Very interesting. Daniel. Okay, Oren, this is one of the most exciting parts of the visit here. These, this stairway. Look, I hope the camera is catching just how amazing it is to ascend up the steps and in front of us we have the kanatir, the set of arches which are really recycling architectural elements from previous periods. You see each column and each capital looks slightly different and behind it the upper central part with an amazing octagonal structure, strikingly reminiscent of Byzantine octagonal churches but this is Muslim. This is the Dome of the Rock. Now, 
not being Muslims, we are not capable of going in to film the rock inside the Dome of the Rock. But let's move towards the entrance and at least talk about what's visible there. Okay, Oren, another fascinating little item that I wanted to show you is laid at the foundation of the Dome of the Rock. This magnificent structure is 1,300 years old. We've established this. But the decoration over it today that are coating it is mostly from Turkish time, this marble and the blue tiles. And when they put the marble, they also decided to recycle a decorative element which really came from a Byzantine period church. This is a chancel screen that once decorated some church, maybe here on the Temple Mount or somewhere in the old city. And if you look very, very closely, although they chiseled it off, there are still some traces of the cross that was once placed here and here. Okay? Never saw it. Again, you need to know where to look and you can find traces of the past of the Temple Mount. Hey, it kind of got crowded. Yeah. Both local Muslim women doing pilgrimage to the site, but also tourists. I want your attention to another fascinating anecdote. Look at this building. This building today is labeled as a Kubba, as a holy Muslim place. But we've already learned that these type of small little columns are typical to the time of the Crusaders. Now I told you already, or in the time of the Crusaders, the Dome of the Rock was labeled as Templum Domini, the Temple of the Lord. You want to guess what this was? A baptismal font, mm. a place to baptize the Christian pilgrims that were now coming up to the Temple Mount. And what I was amazed to discover a few years ago, we actually found the baptismal font that was inside. Follow me. Just like the sarcophagus that became a trough in, in the time of the Ottomans, a sarcophagus from Roman times, the baptismal font was treated in the same way. It was moved out of this chapel and placed next to the cistern. And it is used also to this day as a place to hold water. Maybe not so much these days because now we have running water. But before you had running water, they relied on rainfall accumulated in the cisterns and then taken out, put here. Bring the camera, show the image, show the shape. It's a typical baptismal font from Christian times. Nineteenth century surveys have indicated that there are over 30 underground water reservoirs like these. These are the entries into giant hallways which used to collect the rainfall and supply water for this Temple Mount. Uh, if they are all relating to the Jewish temple, then they were probably in use, in need, to wash off all the animal sacrifice and maybe also provide water for the ritual baths. Today, however, they cannot be examined. The 19th century is the first and last time that they were surveyed. And maybe if the political situation ever enables, there will be some real research done here one day. But of what is visible still on the Temple Mount, some of it is quite significant. We know for a fact that the Dome of the Rock is over natural bedrock, indicating the elevation also of the second and the first temple. And here at the northern end is another small kubba, but it's built on top of bedrock. And if we are standing, stepping now on bedrock, we can say with a good level of certainty that also 2,000 years ago, it, there was a kind of a square temenos, a plaza around the Jewish temple when it stood here. And furthermore, down those steps is another indication of maybe another line of stairway. Let me show you.
This mountain is very difficult to film. We have people looking at us. You cannot really film here with proper gear. We're now uh, appearing like two tourists. Only the mic indicates that maybe it's more than just taking a few selfies. And the hours of visit are very limited. We have maybe five more minutes before they throw us out. But I wanted to get this shot of the last stair in this stairway, another entry or ascent leading up to the upper part of the Temple Mount. And look what you're standing on, Oren. Look at this. These stones are big. Yeah. These stones are heavily eroded. They are ancient. And it is possible that this is too part of maybe, maybe pavement from the time of the temple, the Jewish temple that stood here some 2,000 years ago. Yeah. I've, never, I've never seen it but it does look like Herodian stone. Right, exactly. The size, the erosion, it looks remarkably similar to uh, uh, pavement of the Via Dolorosa or pavement in the Southern Wall Archaeological Park. Exactly. This is Very centuries old, yeah. centuries old. Okay, Danny, so one last thing before we leave the area of the Temple Mount. Yes, we maybe have uh, two more minutes but I did want us to get to the northern edge of the Temple Mount. The Dome of the Rock is there behind us. And the reason that I find this so interesting is because at the northern western edge, you actually have here not a wall, but the rock, the bedrock cut, meaning here bedrock was higher than at the Temple Mount. And when King Herod wanted to create a large temenos around the Temple Mount, this was higher. So he cut it, and most scholars believe that over it, he made a giant fortress, which Josephus calls the Antonia. Now, a very interesting hypothesis that was suggested by the Christians is that the Antonia was the Praetorium. The Antonia was the place of the trial of Jesus. And to this day, the Catholic Church follows this tradition, this assumption, and every Friday, there is a procession from here to the Golgotha, from the Praetorium to the site of the crucifixion of Jesus, what's known as the Stations of the Cross, Via Dolorosa. And this could be a great starting point for the next video, which will be devoted exactly to this, to the Stations of the Cross, the Via Crucis, the path Jesus walked from the place of his trial to the place of where he was put to death. Interesting to see that we always come back to the bedrock. Yes. Always come back to the bedrock. In many churches, not only here, not only in Jerusalem, we only go we to the bedrock. We need the hard evidence. The city is so full of traditions and assumptions and controversies. As an archaeologist, if you're trying to find the truth as much as you can, you need to go to the lowest levels and it starts with bedrock. Danny has just started his own YouTube channel, so if you want to learn more about the archaeology of sites in Israel, then you should subscribe to his channel. I will leave the link below. I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you very much, Danny. My pleasure. And yalla bye.